The best diet for improving your sleep quality is not keto. It's not intermittent fasting. The best diet for improving your sleep quality is not paleo or it's not high carb. It's the proper implementation of different foods that have evidence behind them. So you don't have to be doing any particular diet. I'm going to talk about 10 foods that massively improve sleep based upon evidence-based research. So you can pick and choose. You don't have to do all of these. You take little bits, whatever you want to do. Let's just go ahead and jump right into it. The first one is one that I talk about all the time on this channel. So you can skip through this one if you've heard it before. Tart cherry juice. Literally a quarter cup to half a cup of this stuff has massive impacts on sleep. The American Journal of Therapeutics published a paper looking at tart cherry juice versus placebo. Okay, and they found that tart cherry juice improved total sleep time by 84 minutes. That is insane. That is why it makes number one on this list, just jumping right to the point. And it's still relatively low carb considering how much you actually consume. The reason is tart cherry juice does naturally contain a lot of melatonin, but it also contains a bunch of tryptophan. It also might have something to do with the oxidative kind of stress reducing capacity of it. So it's got a very high ORAC score, which we'll save for another day. Having that warm little sippy cup of milk. Okay, this is kind of crazy because I'm not a big fan of just going out and willy nilly drinking milk. What I am a fan of personally is raw milk. I'm not suggesting you go do that because not everyone can even get it. Okay, but raw milk at least is not pasteurized, so you're retaining the immune benefits, you're retaining some of the other cultures and the microbial effect. But check out this research. BMC Geriatrics published a paper looking at 421 people. Okay, and they found that when subjects had milk, or in this case, even cheese, in tandem with some physical activity, they slept significantly better than those that just exercised or those that of course had no intervention. Now what's the point here, what's going on? It's probably something to do with three things. Protein content, tryptophan. Tryptophan converts to serotonin, which converts to melatonin, but also possibly the casein proteins. Okay, the casein proteins can potentially help you sleep. That's why if you look at old school bodybuilding magazines and stuff, they'll say, have cottage cheese before bed. It's small scale, but it could contribute. Downside is you drink that milk, you're gonna to have to pee in the middle of the night. So maybe just have a little bit of cheese or a little bit of raw milk a couple hours before bed. The next one is fiber. Now what kind of fiber? Now we can get pretty granular with the kinds of fiber. And the cool thing is, is that you don't have to have fiber before bed. You can have fiber sprinkled throughout the day. And what I would recommend you do with fiber is not necessarily just get it from vegetables. Vegetables aren't really the best, best sources of fiber. The best sources of fiber come from things like psyllium husk, they come from things like flax, they come from things uh, like chia seeds, these soluble fibers, right? Glucomannan fiber, shirataki needles, where you don't have to have massive amounts of veggies, because maybe you're concerned with doing that because of gas or whatever, and you don't want to have fiber right before bed, but the evidence is very interesting. There's a study published in the journal Sleep that found that lower carb diets had better REM sleep. Okay, not suggesting you go low carb, but what we're getting at here is further research suggests that the quality of the carbohydrate influences your slow wave sleep, your restorative deep sleep. And the quality of a carbohydrate can massively be influenced by fiber. So fiber changes how the carbohydrates react in our body and the studies are demonstrating better slow wave restorative sleep. Now most of the additional research is starting to point to the microbiome being the potential benefit here. Okay, if the microbiome changes, it is sort of the conductor of an orchestra that is beyond what we can really fathom and understand right now. So being able to send signals from the gut to the brain, that gut-brain access to help us stay calm, that whole serotonin pathway there, that vagus nerve, all that interaction can help us relax and help us fall asleep faster and potentially stay asleep. So if you start adding more fiber into your diet, do it slowly. You don't need to just suddenly add 30, 40 grams of fiber. Just a little bit can make a big difference to change the gut. And if you're not wanting to add copious amounts of fiber at once, I popped a link down below for seed, which is my recommended probiotic because I know people are going to ask. It's a prebiotic and a probiotic tied into one capsule. So it's a capsule inside of a capsule. Very cool technology. The link down below will save you 15%. I'm not a big probiotic guy outside of ones that actually work. And there's a small handful of ones that work. And this one takes the cake, especially when it comes down to the price considering what you're getting. So that link gets you 15% off of seed. Again, you hit that link down below and you use that code Thomas. 15, and that saves you 15% off their daily symbiotics, so check them out. The next one is turkey. Now what's interesting about turkey is it's not just the old turkey has tryptophan thing that we hear about from Thanksgiving. Yes, that is the case. Like as a ratio, turkey has a very high amount of tryptophan to other aminos compared to other meats. But 
Turkey is just very high in protein in general. So that might be why we start to see so much evidence towards turkey being good for sleep. The Western Journal of Nursing Research published a paper that a higher protein diet led to higher sleep quality compared to higher fat diets, higher carbohydrate diets, and low protein diets. So protein influences restorative sleep. So I don't really care how you get it if we really want to get crazy granular. It just seems like bang for the buck, turkey might be the best. I don't expect you to say, hey, hey kids, I'm sorry, I can't have that dinner tonight because I have to have my turkey. But occasionally by adding it in or just increasing your protein throughout the course of the day, like I use the chomps turkey sticks. I think that's a great way. I get turkey in throughout the day. I eat those throughout the day. And that's not even a paid plug or anything. That's a great way for 60 calories to get like 10 or 11 grams of turkey protein straight into my diet. Now this next one's wild. You've probably heard of chamomile tea before, okay? But what's interesting about chamomile tea is it is exceptionally effective. Okay, there was a study published in phytotherapy research, but it essentially emulates a very popular and somewhat abused drug. It's kind of wild. This phytotherapy research study was actually a meta-analysis taking a look at 12 different studies. So it looked at a bunch of different data. It found that chamomile not only improved sleep quality significantly, but there was also a marked improvement in general anxiety disorder. And when you understand the mechanism, it makes sense. Chamomile contains something called apigenin. Apigenin binds to a benzodiazepine receptor. You've probably heard of a benzo before. If you haven't, we're talking things like Xanax and stuff like that, which are used for anxiety. So it would make sense that chamomile would improve anxiety because it's acting on a very similar pathway. In fact, when you look, at pharmaceuticals in general, 40 to 60%, at least as of like 10 years ago, were derived from plants anyway. So it makes sense that we're getting a pharmaceutical-like effect from chamomile when it really is sign of implied that some of these benzos might have come from that in the first place. Here's the thing with chamomile tea. Make it so that it's concentrated without a lot of water. Do like a four ounce serving of it. That way you're getting a concentrated effect, but the downside with having tea before bed is, well, think about it. You're having a bunch of fluid coming in and then four hours later, you're getting up in the middle of the night to pee and you can't fall back asleep. Concentrated dosage of it. You still get that calming effect without maybe having to run to the bathroom later. Okay, the next one, fatty fish three times per week. Doesn't matter what time of day you have it. You could have lox with your breakfast in the morning, you'd have salmon for lunch, you could have salmon for dinner. The paper that I'm referencing here was interesting because it took a look at fatty fish consumption just three times per week over the course of six months. I like this because it was overall larger scale data. It found that compared to other meats, so any other meat like chicken, any other poultry, beef, eggs, salmon or fatty fish led to the biggest improvement in sleep. They also found that it reduced wake time overall and improved regular daily function throughout the course of the day. I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that it probably has to do more so with like the omega-3 content, the docosahexaenoic acid, DHA, but who knows? Like it could be a number of different things. It could also just be, hey, maybe you're getting protein, except when it's compared to equal macronutrients with other meats, it still seems to perform better. So it's gotta be the fatty acid profile. So I recommend just implementing it throughout the week as best as you can. Maybe sardines would work too, mackerel, anything like that. Now we're getting into the weird stuff. The stuff that is weird enough to probably raise some eyebrows, but powerful enough to be worth trying, okay? So the first one is a fruit, kiwi. Now I like kiwi to begin with because kiwi is higher in glucose instead of fructose, which means it's a carbohydrate that your body can just utilize and burn by all cells within the body compared to fructose, which has to be utilized or stored by the liver. So a little bit more slack there. Now the Asia Pacific Journal of Clinical Nutrition published a paper that found that subjects that had two kiwis one or two hours before bed had major improvements in sleep. It decreased their sleep episodes, like how much they woke up and things like that by 5%, and it improved their total sleep time up to 13%. So 13% improvement in your sleep in something that has very, very little calories, a few carbs, which really isn't a big deal. Even if you're doing keto, if you allocate your carbohydrates properly, it's not a big deal. Now, what is the deal here? Why is it working? When we get into mechanisms, it could be a number of different things, but so far the most valid hypothesis is the rich antioxidant capacity. What that means is it's reducing oxidative stress so much in the brain that the brain is able to function better. And when the brain is functioning better, that is actually good for your sleep because it can get into the proper sleep patterns and sleep waves. So this could be a very, very, very big reason. And kiwis seem to take the cake outside of, of course, tart cherry for sleep. But there's one more that's kind of interesting, and that's watermelon, which is the next one. I don't suggest you go eat a half a watermelon before bed. Okay, watermelon is very high glycemic and that will disrupt your sleep. There's evidence that suggests that having high glycemic carbs will help you fall asleep 
but not help you stay asleep. But there's a caveat to that research. There was a study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that found that having a high glycemic carbohydrate four hours before bed improved sleep onset and total sleep versus having it one hour before bed did improve sleep onset a little bit, but sleep quality went down. So if you are going to have something like watermelon that's high glycemic, you wanna have it like four, three hours before bed or so. But why watermelon? Well, watermelon is high glycemic, but the glycemic load, the total amount of carbohydrates in it is quite low. So even though it's a nice spike, it's not so much that it's gonna cause damage. And the hydration effect of watermelon is very powerful. If you were to just drink like, I don't know, 10 ounces of water, compared to drinking 10 ounces of water or consuming 10 ounces of water via eating watermelon, you'd probably hydrate better from the watermelon. Simply because of the carbohydrates, that's gonna draw water in, but also the citrulline, okay, which is gonna increase blood flow. So you're getting more blood flow and more proper hydration to different areas of the body. So watermelon's very unique in that. It's hard to overdo it. You'd have to really eat a lot of it. Then we move into pistachios. Now, pistachios and Brazil nuts. Now, interesting thing about pistachios, they are one of the highest melatonin foods that you could eat. Okay, there's some literature that suggests there's upwards of 20 milligrams of melatonin in like 100 grams of pistachios. I find that a little hard to believe, but it probably has to do with individual crops because there's varying numbers. Bottom line is, it's probably the most melatonin-rich nut, if not food, that you can find out there. It's also high in magnesium, which is gonna help you sleep, but I would be inclined to say that you're probably gonna get a better effect by having maybe an ounce of Brazil nuts. What I would say is do like an ounce of Brazil nuts with maybe a whey protein isolate shake or something an hour before bed. The Brazil nuts contain significant amounts of magnesium, which bind to what's called a GABA receptor, and when it binds in the GABA receptor in the brain, that helps calm you down. It's the opposite of glutamate. If you consume something that has like MSG in it, you know how you feel kind of amped up? That's because it's activating the glutamate side of your brain, so to speak. Whereas Brazil nuts are activating the more relaxing side. So having some protein, which we know is good, along with maybe a small handful of Brazil nuts, which is like four Brazil nuts, that might very well help you sleep. And the last one, which is one we're seeing emerging evidence in that's very, very cool, and it really leans into the whole Mediterranean approach that I'm a big fan of, is hummus. Now, hummus, because of the chickpeas, contains a high amount of vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 is important for two reasons. It's critical to the biosynthesis of melatonin. I'm not a fan of adding melatonin in, I'm a fan of supporting what your body can do naturally. So if B6 supports melatonin synthesis, that means it's gonna help us create melatonin more effectively. Now the other thing that's interesting about hummus is because of the B6, that helps form what's called hemoglobin. Okay, now hemoglobin is what carries the ultimate oxygen, essentially, to the areas of the body that need it. Without hemoglobin, you're not able to have proper red blood cell function and proper oxygenation, which definitely impacts sleep. Okay, if you have low hemoglobin or low red blood cell count, that will impact oxygen delivery to your brain, which impacts the cycles that your brain can go through and the proper sleep waves. So a little bit of hummus with dinner, and it goes with almost anything. Okay, not to mention, if you find the right hummus, you're getting the added benefit of having the olive oil in it too, the monounsaturated fats, which might help with sleep and insulin sensitivity as well. So just to recap here, all the things that we talked about, and I hope you took some notes, you don't have to have just at dinner. You can have sprinkled throughout the course of the day and you can try them one at a time because I would argue that different people are going to have different benefits from each one. I'll see you tomorrow.